are continuing in the book of Proverbs just to confirm where we are, and this is in the orange cover to cover, that we are on page 656, day 145. We're in Proverbs chapter 14, verses 1 through 35. We're getting about halfway through Proverbs, slowly but surely. But I pray that it has been an enlightening journey. Awesome. A lot of life applications. Firstly, I'm going to remind you of your assignments, which is at the end of, what did we say, end of October or end of September? October. End of October. <laughs> Everybody's jumping. That's okay. That's okay. For, I didn't write it down. The end of October, Jennifer said. <laughs> okay. What Proverbs means to me. What does the book of Proverbs mean to me? Okay. End of October. And then end of the year, I'm challenging you to have gone ahead and written your notes for the rest of the book of Proverbs. Okay. Um, really, it's a, it's, a, it's a battle within ourselves. And I hope we're recognizing it, that it is a battle to take time to sit down and go through the word of God. But as, as someone, and I'm going to use the word that they said to me, we need to be intentional about God's word. Because I'm going to say generationally in the church, it's been more of almost like an osmosis. I come, I sit, and hope that stuff absorbs while the pastor's preaching. I'm not going to go home and sit down and study to show myself approved. Even though the word tells me to, people don't really do it. I'm talking church. I'm not talking about outside. Church people do not do that. How do I know? Because the church is weak now. Weak in the word. Weak in the word application. The world is telling us things, and we can't even come against it. We can't even speak against it. We are very weak. And so I'm saying all that to say that we are taking the time to go through the book of Proverbs to strengthen ourselves so that we can go out there and be stronger soldiers for the Lord. Now, one thing that we did touch on, and I did promise that I would do it, um, so we're going to take some time. I don't know if we're going to get back to Proverbs. We'll see. But I was talking about the concordance and how to use the concordance. And so, I'm sorry that I, I'm not strapped up today because I need both hands today, but. I brought the concordance that I had in my house. And actually, my mom's a teacher, so she would always do this, but she actually wrote her name <laughs> in the front cover. Um, but this is the concordance that sits on the bookshelf in my house. Now, the beautiful thing is that we've gone from this <laughs> to this. <laughs> so what I want to do is talk a bit about the concordance. Now, before I say anything about it, does anybody know what a concordance is? First of all, who has a concordance? Oh, my goodness. All right, hands down. Who uses their concordance? Mm. That's the difference, okay? That's like everybody's got a Bible, but who actually reads it? Do you know the Bible is the best-selling book in the world? You wouldn't think so, the way the world is. <laughs> my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so some people have the concordance, and some of those some actually use it. Who can tell me what a concordance is? You have it. Good morning, church. In my view, basically what it does, it um, 
takes the word that you're actually looking up and puts it into perspective and into uh, a certain in perspective. So you would know exactly how to, how to blend it in with what you're understanding. That's my view. I don't know if that's the correct way. Okay, anybody else? In perspective, blend it in. Yes, this is the time, Deaconess. It breaks down the, in different ways the meaning of one particular word so that you can apply it so that everyone understands. To whoever you're speaking to for yourself, it breaks down certain words, the meaning of it, if it's where it came from, um, the basis of it, how it's used. I believe my mom has one at home because mm -hmm. I did use it. And I was like, and I got overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And it, if you take, you know how past would say the Greek meaning and it's used in different contexts, especially if you're about to present the word, you want to make sure that you understand the definition and that whomever you're presenting the word to, that you, that everyone, no matter what, quote, spiritual level they're on, especially when it, from the front row to the back row. So it's just breaking down the scripture, the memory verses for everyone, including yourself. Okay. Thank you. Father Trot? I think it's just a, a reference book. To what? To whatever you're studying. To whatever you're studying, meaning what? I'm dumb. I'm asking you. I'm unsaved. I'm unchurched. I'm asking you. What is a concordance? A reference book to what? To the Bible. To the Bible. Yeah. Okay. Sister Tina? Well, I have the concordance that I have is the one that you helped me to get done. That that's why I put my hand up, but I, I haven't used it yet. So is it also to give you other verses that coincide with what you're reading? Like we're No, you're asking me. I'm, yes, I'm, asking I'm asking you to tell me oh, what it is. Okay. We haven't gotten to that point yet. <laughs> yes, Chief Trot? According to my view is an alphabetical listing of words in the Bible, and it breaks each word down to its origin, meaning, and where else in the Bible you can find that reference, the reference of that word. Okay. So when you put all those definitions together, you pretty much get it. Okay? There were certain key words that I was waiting to hear in your explanations. But what I did was, the very first thing you do when you get a book like this is go to the beginning where it tells you how to use it. <laughs> okay? We tend, like everything else, we get the instruction manual, we put it to the side, and we flip the on switch. And the only time we look at the instruction manual is when something goes wrong. <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's what we do. Kenny, you know that, working at Masters, right? <laughs> we all do it. What I do at home, I have a special drawer where I have manuals for everything in my house. Okay? And every so often I have to go through and say, well, I don't have that anymore, and I don't have that anymore. But I keep them so that when something goes wrong... I have it to refer to, okay? Yeah, these days, and yeah, you, you Google it these days. These were the old days when you didn't have Google, right? So what I did with this particular book that I have, and it's the New Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, okay? Exhaustive, that's why it's so thick, okay? <laughs> It's exhausting just carrying it. <laughs> All right. But I decided, okay, I copied the first page, the first two pages. Now, it's, this book is split up. You have the Hebrew and Aramaic portion, and you have the Greek portion, and we'll get into that. Okay, I'm just going to ask a general question. Yes, Father Trot, you're itching to say something. 
Yeah, this is Hebrew and Greek. Yes. They should be. You should have at least a Hebrew and a Greek. And my question is why? Anybody know why? All of you that have the, you, you put your hands up. You said, I have it. <laughs> Calling you out now. Yes, Chief Trutt. The Bible is written in Hebrew and Greek. The Old Testament is Hebrew and the New Testament is Greek. But why? No, nah, why? The language used at that time. The languages that were used at that time. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to leave it there because it, okay, we'll, we'll explain that. Can you go any further with that explanation or is that anybody else? Can you take it a little further than that? You know me. Okay, we're going to get into that in a minute. So let's have a look at what I just handed out. I am going to read it. So we may not get to Proverbs today, but this is important because this helps us to get um, a little deeper. So it says, this says how to use the Hebrew and Aramaic dictionary. Does everybody have a copy? I know some people came in late. Everybody's got a copy to follow? Okay, good. This says, for many people, Strong's unique system of numbers continues to be the bridge between the original languages, and that's one word I was looking for, original language of the Bible and the English of the King James Version. Okay, so that you know that the Bible was not written in English. <laughs> okay, in a, what is it even written in King James? Vi thy thou. In order to enhance the strategic importance of Strong's Hebrew and Aramaic dictionary for Bible students, it has been significantly improved in this quote unquote brand new up to date version. This version was printed in 1985. Okay. It is now completely retypeset with modern, larger typefaces, which are kind to the eye, and all known errors in the original typesetting have been corrected, bringing this pivotal work to a new level of usefulness and accuracy. So over time, they do improvements, right? What the dictionary is, Strong's Hebrew and Aramaic Dictionary is a fully integrated companion to the, new, to the main concordance. So they've added the dictionary to the concordance. And that's why the book is so big. Its compact entries contain a wealth of information about the words of the Bible in their original language. Underline that. Original language. You can enrich your study of the Bible enormously if you will invest the time to understand the various elements included in each entry and their significance. The example that follows identifies many of these entry elements and the following sections on the transliteration, abbreviations, and special symbols used to offer further explanations. I'm not going to go into all those because there's a portion in there that talks about how you say these words. I'm not going into trying to talk Hebrew. Okay, not, not at this time. <laughs> While no dictionary designed for readers who do not know biblical Hebrew can explain all that a faithful student of the language would know, this dictionary gives the serious student of the English Bible the basic information needed to pursue infinitely deeper and broader studies of God's word. It's all about levels. How, how much do you really want to know the word? Okay. Uh, vast amounts of biblical insight can be gained by using this concordance alone or in conjunction with other time-proven biblical reference works such as Thomas Nelson's Vine's Complete Expository Dictionary of Old and New Testament Words. Whew, that was a mouthful. And Nelson's New Illustrated Bible Dictionary. I believe I do have that at home. Two, using the dictionary with the main concordance. To use this dictionary, locate the number given next to the biblical reference for any particular entry in the main concordance. 
And so on the next page, the second page that I gave you, it gives, um, they're using the word shady as an example. Okay? It says, for example, under shady, you will find Strong's number 6628 next to the first Bible reference shown. Okay? So if you look on um, the second page, you see there the number 6628. All right. Um, lost my place. Job 4021. Okay. Since the reference is in the Old Testament, and since the numeral is set in regular type and not italic type, you know that it refers to the Hebrew and Aramaic dictionary. Like we said, you're going to find in most concordances, there's a Hebrew reference, a Hebrew section, and there's a Greek section. The Old Testament is the Hebrew section, and the New Testament is the Greek section. Because that number is not italicized, it's the Hebrew section. It's also the Old Testament. It's in Job. So you know that you're looking up the Hebrew reference. We're going to get into why in a minute, okay? You may view that enlarged entry here or on page 128 of this dictionary. So if I go into page 128 in this book, I will find that reference, okay? The enlarged example follows, together with the following sections of the explanation, identify the kinds of information such entries provide. Three, using the dictionary to do word studies. And this is where you'll find pastor, when she breaks down and she'll show you in, in the, um, the Greek words are, and she'll go down into all the different words, particular word that she's emphasizing. Careful Bible students do word studies. And the New Strong's exhaustive concordance with this revised newly typeset Hebrew and Aramaic dictionary offers unique assistance Consider, now this is funny, I had to laugh at this because the term love is love that they're using now, and they're using the word love here as the example. So let's have a look. Consider the word love as found in the King James Bible. By skimming the main concordance, you will find these numbers for Hebrew and Aramaic words that the King James Bible translates with the English word love. And then it gives you the series of numbers um, that reference numbers, okay? Now, for any one Bible reference in this entry, there is only one Hebrew word cited. And you may be interested only in establishing the precise meaning for just that word in that occurrence. I'm going to explain that in a minute. If so, it will be very helpful for you to establish the precise meaning for just that word in that occurrence. Now, I'm going to do this right now. Okay. If so, it will be very helpful for you to observe that same Hebrew word in each of its occurrences in the Bible. In that way, you develop an idea of its possible range of meanings, and you help clarify what it probably meant precisely in the specific Bible reference you are studying. But don't overlook exploring each Hebrew and Aramaic word translated as love. You may wish to take note that as you look up each occurrence of the word that goes with 157 and then each occurrence of the word that goes with 160 and so forth. This method gives you an excellent basis for understanding all that the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, signifies with the King James Version's word love. Okay. Somebody tell me what this word means. Mine. Who can tell me what this word means? Belonging to, possession, owned. Okay, belonging to, possession, own, 
Deaconess De Silva. Mine, um, uh, what is it? Like a cave where they um, have ah. precious elements yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and whatnot. So which answer is correct? How can they both be correct? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, My, Jennifer. I'm trying to get various people to answer. Yes, the, the word is correct, depending on what you intend to use it for, the context. The C word, context. So this is what they're explaining here. Love, you got to find the original word because love means lots of different things. Depends on the context. Hence, you can't say love is love because love in the Bible has very many different meanings. Just like mine. You both were right, but until you understand the context, you don't know which word you're talking about. Okay? So that, I did that to explain what I just read. You look up the word love under 157, and let's carry on because it's going gonna, it's gonna to explain it itself. Okay, I'm getting excited. I got excited when I read this. So Now see the dictionary entry 157 itself and notice that after this symbol, all, and it's dot, dot, dash, all the words and word prefixes and suffixes are listed. So... These show you that this one Hebrew word, ahab, and I looked it up in, in here under 157. I did that, that exercise. is translated into several different but related words in the King James Bible. Beloved, love, loved, lovely, lover, like, befriend. Under ahab. This list tells you the range of uses of the one Hebrew word in the King James Bible in that particular verse. Okay? This information can help you distinguish between the nuances of meaning found where this and the other Hebrew words are translated by these same words and similar ones in the King James Bible. So you may find that word ahab in different locations. And what this, the concordance does, and it depends. You have some abbreviated ones or you have an exhaustive one that will give you every single verse throughout the entire Bible where that one word shows up, ahab. Okay, but let's go back to the first paragraph. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different numbers for that word love. So where 157 means ahab, and, we, and I just said what that particular word means, beloved, love, lovely, lovely, lover, like, befriend, number 160 has other meanings for love. Number 2836 has other meanings again for love. It's a different word, and it means something totally different. Just like mine, right now, we have two different numbers. We have Tyra number one, and we have Arlene number two. Because your, your two definitions meant something totally different for the same word. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Tyra's got a comment. And it's so funny you said that because had you stopped at me, I wouldn't have considered uh -huh. the other definition. That's right. I mean, hence what you're saying, what you're doing right now. I hadn't even thought of the other definition until yep. you went, you got another perspective. Yep. Which is what this is all about. Yeah. And I was going to say also, um, some people. Some people say that Jonathan was gay because... Of his love right, for David. Right, mm -hmm. right. And that's what came to mind. But unless they go to the word, 
then they truly would. And even this, there, because there are some mm-hmm. that do go to the word, that do know the word, and still will say that he was gay. Mm-hmm. But you, like you said, until you dig deeper, you won't, and you're truly in God's word, you won't understand the context of the word love in that aspect. Yes. Excellent point. Excellent. And the thing is, um, Mother De Silva and then Sister Tina, the thing is, is that people who want to still choose that Jonathan and David were gay, you have to understand the character and nature of God. Okay? That's why you've got to understand the entire word. Does God approve of homosexuality? I'm asking the question. No. No. So that, so that can't be. All right? You, you, thank you for pointing to the brain. You've got to think this thing through. Study to show yourself approved. Okay? It takes more than getting a daily devotional, reading it, say, oh, okay, I did my Bible study for the day. Not enough. Because Satan knows the word, too. He tried to use it on Jesus. And the funny thing is, I was doing some work yesterday, and I was listening to one of Dr. Jeremiah's teachings. And he said that when Satan went to Jesus and tried to tempt him with the word, Jesus quoted out of Deuteronomy back to Satan. So Jesus knew the old, well, I mean, he only had the Old Testament back then. Think about it. Jesus didn't have the New Testament. The New Testament wasn't written until he was long dead. He had the law. So he quoted out of Deuteronomy against Satan. But if we're just getting our daily devotional and putting it down, are we, are we getting ourselves ready for the spiritual attack that's going to come on us? No. And this is why we can't answer the love is love, because we don't know any better. But excellent point. So it's not just understanding the word. It's understanding the character of God that will prove it. Yes, yes. Mother DeSilva. Thank you. This is helping me because someone was arguing, saying that Jesus said, Peter, lovest thou me three times, and they was using that, that um, to be gay. Yes, so it's helping me. Thank mm-hmm. you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the fact that they're using love as the example, I'm telling you, I was cracking up when I saw this. i like, okay, I have to print this out and actually read it. Uh, Tina and then Jennifer. Never mind, you answered it. Okay. You, you spoke it. Okay. Just as the Bible says that in the last days, men will become lovers of themselves. Mm-hmm. And they don't want to look at that because they're not taking that into context of what that means either as far as homosexuality is concerned. They just think that God is his loving, but he is against the lover of men and men. It clearly says it in the Bible, but they're not looking at the context. No. Well, they're not even reading the Bible. They're not not taking into account those verses, right? And so this is why we must read and understand the entire word of God. It ties together. It really does, okay? These three ways of using the dictionary in conjunction with the main concordance show you only a sampling of the many ways this particular book can enrich your study of the Bible. But if you turn over to the example, okay, and then it goes through. So now this is for this particular book. You, some of you have brought your own, and what you need to do is to do what I'm doing. Go to the instructions that tell you how to use it, okay? <laughs> I know. (laughs) All right. So this particular book here, it gives you a number. All right. Now, for those of you that have a concordance on your phones, I have the Strong Concordance app on my phone. The Strong Concordance app gives me, and I know it's hard to see, the chapter or the book. I can go to a particular verse, and then I get the entire Bible text, okay? All I do is tap on any word, and it will show me the Strong's number. So what did I just tap? All right, so I'm going to go to Genesis 1-1, chapter 1 and verse 1. And 
I tapped on, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I tapped on God. And what I got was the Strong's number, which is what we see here. The Strong's number, 6628 for shady. Remember, they're using shady here. But I tapped on God. I got Strong's number H430. H means Hebrew. It's in the Old Testament. It's going to be Hebrew or Aramaic. Now, I'm stopping there because I'm going to explain why it's Hebrew or Aramaic, okay, or Greek. So, we haven't gotten there yet. Which king are we under right now in our studies? We are under Solomon. Okay? Solomon is whose son? David. David. Very good. We haven't gotten this far yet. Okay? But uh, under David, you had the entire nation of Israel. Right? What happens under Solomon? After Solomon, the kingdom splits. Okay? You have the divided kingdom. Under This is Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Okay? Spoiler alert. Solomon messes up. Because he messes up, the kingdom splits. Okay? So under Jeroboam, you have Israel. Under Rehoboam, you have Judah. Ten tribes go under Israel and two under Judah. Because Solomon messes up, the Lord splits the nations. But because of God's love for David, two of the nations are going to stay under his son. Remember, God promised David that his line would continue. The line is continuing, but only two tribes. Okay? When we go through kings, that's a ride in itself. All right? But what happens in all eventuality after you go through all the different kings is that Judah becomes captured by Babylon. Anybody know the king? Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar. And if you remember, that's where Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and all that. Yes, I like to use their Hebrew names. Right? They're, they're, that was their Hebrew names. Their Babylonian names were what? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Okay? I like to use their Hebrew names. Under... Um, Israel gets taken over by Syria. Okay? Well, the other name is Aramea. So the language that is common in Syria and Aramea is Aramaic. Right? Now I'm going to show you something interesting here. The Israelites and the Arameans eventually start marrying and having children. And their children
were the Samaritans. And if you remember, you heard preaching about the Samaritan woman. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They did not consider them pure Israelites because they had been joining up with the, with the Syrians, with the Arameans. But this, these people were up north. Okay, and Jesus came from Galilee, which is up north. So you find that the New Testament was written in Hebrew and Aramaic because a lot of the Israelites, that's where they came from. So that's why in concordances, the language would be either in Hebrew or Aramaic. Where the New Testament, much of which was written by Paul, the Greek language was common during his time. And so that's why when you're looking up the New Testament, you are looking for the Greek original language. And that's the difference. Okay? So, I go back to my references online because I'm looking in Genesis 1.1 and I tapped on that word God, I'm finding the Hebrew reference, which is number 430. It gives me the Hebrew word, which I cannot even... In, in that writing... <laughs> I would love to learn that language one day. But it also gives me the English, Elohim. Not Jehovah, Elohim. And then it gives me the definition. God's, and, and it, it goes into a whole lot, but the supreme God, mighty, great, and all of that. It goes, gives me all those references. Okay? So, and then when I go down... It gives me all where it occurs in the scriptures. That word Elohim. And it goes on and on and see, on and on and on and on. And that's what happens in this book. That's why it's so thick. Because it's going to give you every scripture reference where that particular word occurs. All right? So that's why when we're preaching and, and wanting to get... You can't just go off of what you see in the English language. You've got to find the original word and what it actually means. And is this the right context in which I want to use this word? It's a lot more than just reading it. That's, that's, that's why it's so important. And look, I'm still scrolling, and Elohim is still going, right? Still going, still going, finally stopped, okay? Okay. 152 occurrences for your God, your God. But it's got oh, so many other occurrences, okay? And that's just one word. So going back to the paper, so that Strong's number corresponds to the numbers at the ends of the context lines in the main concordance. Okay, so this is drawing reference specifically to how this book up here is laid out, okay? But what you want to look for is that particular number. Then it gives you the Greek or Hebrew words written in the original Hebrew or Aramaic spelling. And then it's all the little symbols and signs. I'm not going to go into all of that. It says the degree symbol denotes the presence of the textural variation. See special symbols. The Hebrew or Aramaic word represented in English letters in the bold type. The transliteration. It tells you how to pronounce it. Do you see the sign there? The arrow. Strong's... Uh, Syllable by syllable pronunciation in italics with the emphasized syllable marked by the accent. You see where I'm looking at? 
Okay, do you see it says T-S-E-H and then there's a little um, accent up top there? That means that when you're pronouncing it, the main emphasis is on that section. Teshel is how you would say that. Teshel, okay? If it was on the E-L, meaning God, right? Then the accent would be behind it. Teshel. Teshel and Teshel. You see the difference? And then it gives you the information regarding the relationship to other Hebrew or Aramaic words. From the unused root meaning to be slender, the lotus, a shady tree. And it'll, it'll tell you it could be, it could be a plural based on, um, like, again, I'm going to go back to my online reference. It'll say, okay, this is the plural of word number 433. So now I have to tap on 433 to go back to find out what that word was. And then it says it's probably prolonged from 410. So I have to go to 410. I'm telling this is some serious study, people. That's why God tells us study to show yourself approved. Just getting a daily bread every day is not enough. But that's what the church has settled for. Oh, I get my daily bread. I get my daily devotional every day. You think that's enough? That's not enough. That's why we're so weak. And it's still sending me to other words. It's going around and around. I've had to tap six times to get to the bottom word. Remember, it was Elohim, right? I've gone to H193. Ool which is spelled U-W-L, from an unused root word meaning to twist or by implication to be strong. The body as being rolled together, also powerful, mighty, strength. That's the root word for Elohim, almighty, all-powerful. But I had to go through six times to get to the root word. And that's just Genesis 1-1. So we've taken this whole by Sunday school lesson to explain this, okay? But I want you to understand why we have to take time to study God's word, especially in this love is love generation, okay? Because as we have studied, there's Love. We have Eros, Storge, Agape. What's the other one? Philos, and it's one more. I have Storge. Philos, Eros, Storge, Agape, Philos, and I know it's one more and it's going out of my head what it is, right? So there are, um, Eros is uh, physical, sensual, Storge is familial, brotherly, God's love, and I know it's one more, but I can't remember what it is. So love, there's five different definitions. So which love are you talking about when you say love is love? Because the love of God, God may be love, but God deals with us too in his love. So you can't just say, oh, well, love is love. Which love are you talking about? Most people who say love is love want to justify eros, the physical, the sensual. Oh, you can love whoever you want. Not by God's agape love you don't. You should love the Lord your God and have no other gods. That means you're going to follow what God loves. And the only way you'll know what God loves is to read his word and get to know his character. And when you know his character, you know that he hates homosexuality. It's a sin. It's an abomination. But to just say love is love, we get trapped because we don't understand. 
all of what we've talked about today. So in closing, I encourage you. I hope this has helped in your understanding of how to use a concordance, how to study the word. Don't just leave it at, and let me tell you something about King James. The only reason why they have the thys and thou's is that's how they talked back then. God didn't say the thy thou. That's how they wrote it back in the King James era. So if, if you're not quoting scripture using the thys and thou's, you're okay. Some people say, oh, no, you're wrong. No, 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 no. Don't, don't be fooled by that. We have the English version because we speak English. <laughs> All right? Somebody challenged me about that, too. Have you ever read it in... I can't even remember what language they, they said. I said, no, I don't speak that language. I speak English. But I read the inspired word of God. But I don't just read it just to read it. I have a concordance. I look up the words and understand them in their context. And that's what we must do. We must get better and stronger. So we don't come here and we take what pastor, my son, I went to church on Sunday, God, I'm good. Nope. I listened to this, the sermon, I'm good. Nope. I got my daily devotional, I'm good. Nope. Because I'm telling you right now, the enemy is going to test all of that. He's going to see what you really got out of all of that. And unless you take time, and like I said to somebody this week, 15 minutes. Just 15 minutes a day. If you can't do an hour, just do 15 minutes. Start there. And build up on it. But get into God's word as it's meant to be. All right? Any questions? We got like two minutes. <laughs> Read the instructions. <laughs> That's the first thing. Okay? Yes, Brother Kenny, we have two minutes. Yes, um, I just got one question. Um, I'm reading the back of my NIV concordance, and it's mentioning Strong's. Uh, is it Strong Vata, or is it just a, another way of um, dealing with all these references? Strong seems to be the one that comes out on top as kind of the benchmark to use. You've got, to, you've got to kind of get familiar with your own to see if you... And of course, you know, this opens the gateway to having various ones. Mm -hmm. This is where you start building up your library, okay? Um, but Strong's does seem to be the benchmark. We also have the app, the Blue Letter Bible app, which is, oh my goodness, it's like Disneyland when you go in there, man. See if you can find your way out. But the Blue Letter Bible has Bible text, but it has concordances and all um, commentaries, all sorts of things in there. Um, and if you want to uh, have a look at it, we can have a conversation about it if you want to have a look at that. Um, it is an app, so I would have to show you on my phone. It's nothing I can show you right here, okay? But to answer your question, strong seems to be the benchmark to use when it comes to a concordance. In your library, you should have a Bible, a dependable translation of the Bible, concordance, dictionary. All right? Commentaries are good, but I don't like to read commentaries until I have sought God's word myself and heard from the Lord. Then I'll... Later, I'll check the commentary because I don't want the commentary to become my opinion. Okay? I don't want it to lead me. And, so, and what I have found in many cases is after I've done what I've had to do, preached or whatever, and then I read the commentary, and it's exactly what the Lord had revealed to me originally. But you will get confirmation. Okay? But don't let commentaries lead your thoughts. Don't depend on them. Don't get caught in that trap, okay? Let the Lord and his Holy Spirit, who lives within these pages, guide you. 
and you'll receive confirmation. Talk to Pastor Seaman. Let her know what your thoughts are. She's, she's there. She's your resource, okay? Um, and I pray that this has helped um, and, and strengthened us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that today is a, a new day for some to seriously study your word to show themselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. Lord, there's so much deception going on right now in the world, even with that word love. But thank you, Father, even in this lesson that you've shown us that your love is the true love. And as we get to know you and your character, we will line up our lives to reflect you and your love. Thank you, Father, for your word that is guiding us through these times. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, that through his blood we have salvation. Through him, thank you for your Holy Spirit who dwells within us, who comforts us and guides us. And Lord, as we read your word, as we study your word, as we get to know your character, we will hear your voice even more to guide us and to bind us together with cords of love that cannot be broken. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. 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 Thanks, everybody.